house pen on the upright to Jesus until my years shall end to all who need a savior my friend I read come in because he brought salvation is why I am his friend I'll be a friend to Jesus my life for him I'll spend I'll be a friend to Jesus until my year shall end and the saint said amen amen I'll be a friend to Jesus amen let's go to heavenly father in prayer at this time Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we come approaching your throne of grace and mercy with gratitude within our beings. Thanking you so much, Father, for letting us be able to see another day, Father. It's you that woke us up this morning, Father, and started us along our way, Father. You blessed us and allowed us to be able to make it to this building safe and sound, Father, and we pray for others that are meeting all over the world, Father, not only here, Father, but Father, as we come together on this Lord's Day, this Sunday, we come for purpose of worshiping you in spirit and truth, glorifying you in our body and edifying the, edifying the church, Father. We pray for those that wanted to be here but was unable to be here. We pray for those that could have been here but chose not to be here, Father. We pray, Father, that they would come to themselves before it's too late, Father. And Father, as we come together, Father, to study another portion of your word at this time, Father, we pray that you would give the instructions of ready recollection of things they're going to bring before us, Father, as we study your word together, Father, that your word will not fall on deaf ears, but fall upon receptive hearts, Father, and we may be able to receive your word and we may be able to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. We pray that you would be a fence of protection around the building, Father, that you'd be a shield of protection around each and every one of us, Father, as we, those that are here and those that will enter this building, Father. And Father, we pray that as we come together, Father, we would do all that we do in worshiping you, Father, praising you and singing, praying, giving, Father, and also in communion, Father, in the word, Father would meet your approval, Father. We thank you. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise for it's in the matchless name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. They tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend or within the hall. A pilot, he stood with a friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus, my life for him. I'll spend, I'll be a friend to until my year shall end. Amen. Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. We're going to continue with praying for my brother. We did the first half last week. Did everybody get a paper? I handed some out after service last night. Sister Caprice needs one. I'm back in this corner. 
Sister Hale, let's see if I can get somebody to grab those for me. I think, I think they're in the office. So we did numbers one, two, and three. We skipped number four, and then we did five and six. So today we're going to do number four, and then skip down seven through ten. I'm trying to get somebody's attention here. Yeah, if you can ask Nate, they should be um, near the printer or in the chair in the office there. Praying for my brother. Okay, so in review, let's go back over a few items from last week. Go ahead and go to the next slide if you can, Bria. One of the questions I pose is, who should we be praying for? Do you remember? What was that, Sister Dunn? For all men, especially those of the household of faith. What about our enemies? Are we supposed to pray for our enemies? Yes. yes. And we had quite a discussion about how hard that can be. If you have a coworker that's constantly throwing you under the bus, piling on, nitpicking little, oh, you didn't do this or you didn't do that, but you're doing twice the work that that person does, but they continually poking at you, getting on your last nerve. So I, I pointed out and Sister Dunn, her, her comment came from Galatians 6, verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And then the enemy question, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, but I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. So good, good responses there. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, what did Jesus say to Peter? And that's another um, passage that we spent quite a bit of time on, right? I talked about the, the separating or the sifting of the wheat, the shaking, so does anybody have that passage, Luke 22, 31, and 32? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. Amen. What was the two words before strengthen thy brethren, Rayford? Uh, he says, and when you have returned to me. Returned to me. Yeah. So that's not the King James. Do you have the so American King Standard James. or ESV? It's the New King James. New King James. But Brother Hilton uh, read that last week, and I think it's very important that you see that distinction He's, he knows that Peter's going to stumble, right? He knows what's going to happen before it happens. In uh, King James, it uses the word converted. And we talked about, you know, he was already converted, right? In, in the aspect of what shall I do to be saved, hear, believe, repent, confess. He was converted, but... He had, a, he had a, a, tri a trial, a stumble, a fall. And so in Rafer's um, reading, he uses return to me instead of converted. So that was a very interesting point. It's important that we see the distinction or difference there. So when we talked about sifting wheat, I talked about how, whether it be gold or wheat, you have a tray or a pan, something with a grid in it, and you would shake it to separate the, the grain or the kernel from the chaff, right? So 
you're doing a process to separate what you need from what the waste or the byproduct is. So in this uh, passage, Jesus is telling Peter, Satan desires you. He wants to separate you. And I brought up the point at first glance, you might think they're trying to separate Peter from the other disciples or apostles, but if you dig a little deeper, you see that we have a carnal man and a spiritual man, and Satan's driving the wedge between the two so he can get at that carnal man, right? He knows that his weakness, you know, now I got him. You know, to use basketball terms, if you're a 6'8", 265 pound power forward, and a 5'11 or 6 foot point guard ends up on you down on the block, Bob knows, hey, this is, this is taking candy from a baby. I got this. I'm just going to back him in, lay it up. So it's important that we see that Satan is trying to separate or drive that wedge in there so he could attack Peter. He could get to the carnal because we all have a fleshly or carnal side. We all have a spiritual man. And the more that we read his word, the more that we work on our relationship with God, the stronger that spiritual man is going to be. And so we have trials and tribulations in our life. We won't so quickly take a left turn or veer from the straight and narrow. We're going to keep on that righteous path. Any questions or comments about that passage? All right. The term of uh, ha have you is sort of like the term of possession. He's, yeah. Dom domination. He, he's going to, you know, tie you up. He's going to put, you know, use you for his bidding, right? He, he, can, he can take this asset and lift it up and stick it over here to do what he wants to with you. So that's a very good point. He desires to have you. All right. Um, we had the question, is it difficult to continue feeling ill will toward a person for whom you are fervently praying for daily? I think the overall consensus was, yes, it's hard to feel ill will for somebody who you were praying for, whether it be your coworker, your boss, your neighbor that might be pointing out to the homeowner association, hey, he's got weeds in his yard. Hey, his limbs are crawling over the fence into my yard. Send him a, a notice. He needs to trim his tree, stuff like that. But um, I think that's a good point. If you're earnestly praying for someone, it's hard to have ill feelings towards them. And we could, we could talk about government officials, the mayor, the governor, the president, those in Congress. We are commanded to pray for our leaders, right? So you might not agree with who's in that particular office or their policies, but we are commanded to pray for them. Doesn't, doesn't say if you like them or voted for them, pray for them. We're commanded to pray for our leaders. And then back to the point about return to me. Jesus has a task or a job for Peter to do in the future. So he knows, he's aware that he's going to stumble going forward. But when you return to me, I need you to strengthen the brethren. I have a specific thing that I need you to carry out or task that I need you to do. All right. Let's move on. Did... 
The people who didn't have a paper, did I know, Tapriz needed one, the sister back in the corner, did everybody get one that was looking for a paper? I'll see if I can get Nate's attention. He's back there in the foyer, so we still need a couple more. All right, it's up on your screen, question number four, James 5, verses 13 through 16, is a passage that encourages prayer. What are some circumstances that should prompt Christians to pray for their brethren as given in this passage? And when we get a little deeper into it, we'll talk about, because last week we made the distinction of praying for others. Now we're a little bit more specific, praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do I have a reader that could read James Chapter 5, thir verses 13 through 16. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right, thank you, Brother Flowers. So let's start with the first part of verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? What are some other words or examples for affliction? Sick. Suffering. Somebody who has lost their job somebody who's had a death in their family, um, have a flat tire on the freeway. I mean, any time that, you know, things are just turned upside down or throw you off, right? So obviously there might be some different levels of affliction there, but those are things that, hey, I got a flat tire, Either my spare is flat or I can't find the jack. I need some help, right? I'm in a state where I could be overwhelmed or have need for help. Um, Webster's definition says, affliction is a state of pain, distress, grief, or misery. But how about, especially if talking about the early saints or the early church here, how about those who were persecuted? Those who were imprisoned unlawfully or unrighteously? That was a form of affliction, right? All right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Verse number 11, Matthew chapter 5 reads, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse number 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So again, just pointing out that persecution is also a form of affliction. Did it. Did anybody else need a lesson? Roy's got a couple in his hand, I think, or one left. Brother Roy, back in the corner there, thank you. Can we think of any other circumstances that we should pray for 
our brethren. Yes. Absolutely. And you know, we when we do prayer requests, people put various things. I'm planning to travel out of state this week. I, you know, I'm interviewing for a job. Please pray for me. So there's a lot of circumstances that we would pray for one another. But I just thought in this passage, specifically talking about affliction, those who are, you know, troubled, having um, grief, loss of a loved one, life-changing uh, thing that happened to them. So... The passage I just read in Matthew about being persecuted, and then he says, you know, rejoice when you're persecuted. So when you're beaten down, when people speak evil against you, when they're, you know, technically throwing stuff your way, right? They're mudslinging, they're tearing you down. We are told to rejoice. We need to be encourage we need to have a positive attitude rather than curling up in a ball and say they're all attacking me you know i'm just gonna curl up or hide under the desk here we're instructed to rejoice yes it is yes it is Back to last week's discussion and the talking about sifting of wheat. Those are things that shake you. When you get rattled, how do you respond? You have to have, I think one of the sisters said, a firm stance or grounded. If you've got a base, you're not going to blow over in the wind, right? So good point, Brother Flowers. Um, I just listed a couple of scriptures. There's dozens, but just reassuring scriptures. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Isaiah 41 and 10 reads, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Amen. Any other um, encouraging scriptures? Go ahead, sister. Amen. Amen. I haven't had a flat tire lately, thank God. <laughs> but six, eight years ago, my family was on vacation. We were in Las Vegas, and we went to morning worship Sunday, and we had just got on the highway. I think we took the 15 down, and then I think it was five something that goes east and west heading towards Boulder City. And right there on the freeway, I had a blowout. I mean, I got off the road, got the vehicle stopped, but 
even though I was rattled, the first thing I did is close my eyes, said a quick, you know, five, ten second prayer. God, thank you for not letting us get hit another car or run off the road. Please allow me to, you know, get this fixed so we can get back on our way. To him. There you go. <laughs> Didn't I just say that earlier? You get a flat tire and either the donut doesn't have air, or your spare doesn't have air, or you can't find the jack. And that happens. You would think that, you know, the car comes with a jack, and but we do things. <laughs> well, come come see me after service, Sister Silas. We'll get we'll get you taken care of. <laughs> Bob, did you have a comment? I just see you shaking your head back there. But yeah, this, like you said, it's, it's, it's hard to. It's hard to you know, we say pray for your enemy, but we, sometimes we want to pray P R E Y. Oh, help us. Right. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not for me or you, right? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Bria, can you click the next slide, please? Good, good discussion. Thought question. When we pray, what are hindrances to our praying for our brothers and sisters as we ought? If you remember, one of the questions last week just said, what are some hindrances to our praying? Now we're being a little more specific. We're praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. What can be some hindrances to our praying for our brothers and sisters? Amen. Sister Stevens, if you have aught with your brother or sister and you haven't resolved it. Does anybody remember the passage? I believe it's in Matthew. Let's flip over there. I want to say it's either 5 or 18. Let me take a look here. Matthew 5. So Matthew 5, 22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In verse number 23, I skipped a little bit of 22. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Where are they leaving? Where are they uh, leaving their gift at the altar, right? So this is an act of worship. This is a spiritual thing. But we're being instructed: you need to make amends with your brother before you come to worship. Before you, you know, lay your gift or alms at the altar. I think, uh, Bob, are you, are you the one that said it's easier said than done sometimes? <laughs> but that stresses the importance, right? This isn't, you know, I'm just mixing cake batter or doing tasks around my home. Gee, I, you know, me and Daniel, we had a disagreement. I need to reach out or go see him to get this straight. This is, you're going to worship, 
you're going to lay your gift at the altar, there's something in your mind that you need to get straight before you can put aside the cares of this world so we can focus on God to worship because there's something else in here, right? So great point, Sister Stephen. So that's a relationship between you and a brother or sister. What other relationship could hinder our prayer? We don't have faith. And we just don't believe. A relationship with God. Amen. Amen. So you said if we don't have faith, don't believe, Sister Stevens. Go ahead. We finished the service. Yeah. He's, also in relation to God, sin. There you go. If we're a guilty distance. If you have unrepentant sin, then we're... No, we, we have strayed away. You know, we... we I think one of Juanita's aunts back in Kentucky in the bathroom, there's that Footprints poem. And it's got a picture of sand. And it's got the two sets of footprints, and then you just see one, and it's saying, God, you, you know, you left, where did you go? And then he goes on to tell you, you were so weak, I had to pick you up and carry, I didn't leave you, but your faith was weak, you were stumbling, I picked you up and carried you. So again, our relationship with God Sin, first and foremost, separates us from God. And, you know, we, we veer from him. It's not that he has moved. He has stayed there. We have moved from him. But also, our relationship, are we reading? Are we studying daily? Are we daily telling ourselves, what can I do to be more like Christ? Am I compassionate towards others? Am I helping those who are in need? Sister has a flat tire. Do I just get in my car and drive off? And so, again, things that, and I think that that's a real, there's a lot of meat here, but it's important to see those two different relationships and how they affect your relationship with that person that you have awe with, or they may have a grievance against you and then also our relationship with God. Any other questions and comments before we move on to the next one? All right, number eight. If you could click the next slide, Maria. What are some steps that can be taken to remove these hindrances? So, if, if we have unrepentant sin, you know, confess, pray, ask that God forgive you and you be added back to the fold. And if I'm not diligently seeking his will, got my nose in this book, pray that I use my time more wisely. I make it a priority daily to open a scripture and study his word. So that helps my personal growth, but more importantly, it's strengthening my relationship with God. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Because the more you're with your brothers and sisters and like minded people, the closer you get not only to them, but the closer you get to God. So when you're really with your family, your eternal family, that helps your strength right along with standing the word, you know, getting strength for one another. So it just helps to be with 
Amen. Amen. And I think last week somebody suggested we need more fellowship. We need to do things other than come here to worship. Amen. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You should and just and a lot, a lot of times you know when you only time you know you may call somebody if you want something. You know, I didn't think that clear before me. Brother, sister, I, I just call you and see how you doing. I don't want nothing to go. <laughs> just encourage you. Yeah. That, that's something I try and do. How many people know that I do? I try to send encouraging Text. messages. Yeah. So folks, you know, to encourage you because that's a command. That's that's what we do most. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's building up the church. That's part of the work of the church. So it's something we need to do daily. Yes. Can't call it. Yes, sister. Yes. Absolutely. Not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. All right, let's move on to number nine. Time is rapidly getting away from us, and we got some good stuff here. Paul must have spent a great amount of time in prayer. Consider the first few verses of each of Paul's epistles and make a list of those for whom Paul prayed continually. So, what what are the books that Paul wrote, or what are Paul's epistles? Don't be shy. Come on, help me out. Romans, Galatians. Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. So, in First Thessalonians, how does he start that address? He says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. So the epistles are what? Letters to the church. And these are specific locations. So Thessalonica. Okay. The church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. So he's praying for the church at Thessalonica. And he's, he's praying for the saints. He's thanking God for you all because he knows that they are praying for him. I think, was it two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, we talked about how, you know, Paul is encouraging prayer, but it's a two-way street. He's telling them, I'm praying for you, but he also wants you, pray for me also as I journey, as I go on this mission, pray for me. So the importance of, it's a two-way street, right? It's reciprocal. It's not just Paul is praying for them. Any other examples in Paul's epistles that... I mean, most of them say the church, but there's a couple of places. I think Galatians says all brethren. Ephesians says the saints at Ephesus. But Paul is emphasizing, I'm praying for you all continually. And he's also uh, pleading or asking them, continue to pray for me as we continue on our mission. What did you say, Nate? Colossians? Okay. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I think I didn't really spend much time on it at the beginning, but I said last week we just talked about things that could hinder our prayer. But now we're specifically talking about praying for our brother and sister. We're members of the body. What, what's different about that? How does that distinguish if I'm praying for Daniel versus my neighbor across the street or somebody that I used to work with? Why is my relationship with Daniel above or on a higher plane than my relationship with my neighbor across the street or my coworker? He's my brother in Christ. Um, when we were talking about Ananias and Sapphira, the verses preceding that said they, they had all things in common. We are to be of one mind, of one accord, teaching the same thing. So, yeah, he's my brother in Christ, but because he's my brother in Christ, we have that in common. We, we know what's what. How many churches did Jesus purchase? One. When he says, I will build it, that's not plural, right? That's singular. So there's an understanding. There's things that I don't even have to ask him. Hey, what do you think about this? What is it? I know that we're on the same page. Also, Brother T.J. said that he prayed for them and prayed for him. Absolutely. And also, we got to think he prayed for himself. Yes. Yes. Let them know in advance that I'm praying for you like your own. I'm praying for you now. I'm looking forward to, to come to into you. you. Yes. So, yes. All right. And it's not limited to just us here at Council of Leaders. Amen. 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 Um, I. I mean, I, I don't consider myself Ron McNally, but I travel quite a bit. And if I go to Nashville, Tennessee, I know where the saints come together there. And I know if I had a flat tire in Nashville, Tennessee, besides my wife's brother, there are other members of the body I could pick up the phone and call. If I'm in Portland, Oregon, I know I can pick up the phone and call Brother Ray Ellison. Hey, he'll come and help me. And other brothers at Mallory. Right, all over. Amen, amen. That's a very good point. All right, let's move on to the next slide, number 10. In James chapter 5, verse number 16, what is said of the value of prayer? I think we read 13 through 16 earlier, but let's reread, if I could get a reader to reread James 5, 16. Amen. Amen. Do you think we're sometimes guilty of underestimating the value of prayer or the importance of it? Amen. Guilty. Yes. Yeah. 
action happens. You know, there's the, the, the symbolism can move mountains, but with God, all things are possible. We, with our mortal mind, we get locked in that, oh, that, you know, I can't do that. I can't fix this. Just a second, Daniel. Sister Gonzalez. It connects. Yes. Amen. We can pray, but if we are not right with God, and you know, y'all are talking about actions and stuff like that, you begin with your mindset. Because our actions can go a long way. But your mindset, if you're not in with God, then it's not going to be effective. Amen. And Amen. You will be able to know the fact. You know, it's not all about physical, it is mental. Your mindset has to be the same. Like that sister said, be with like minded people. But once you leave that, area of like-minded people. Remember, it's your mindset that you have your relationship with God. That anything you do is going to be righteous in front of Him and it's going to be effective in showing others that you're working with God. And doesn't that kind of tie into what Brother Flower said earlier? Having faith or the belief that your prayer will come to fruition. Because I'll raise my hand. I've been, oh, God, please let this happen. But if I doubt or don't believe he's going to make it happen, what good, why did I even utter those words? Daniel. When you look at Nate's father as well, yeah. sometimes he's thought consistent. Yep. Keep reading. He gives an example of Elias. Prayer. Yes. He talks about how Elias or Elijah. Yep. Man subject to like passions as we are. So he's given a comparison that Elijah was just like us. He he was a fleshly being just yeah. like us. He had the yeah. same he had passions too. <laughs> and he prayed earnestly to God that it wouldn't rain. And then look at the span that it didn't rain. Mm-hmm. And then he prayed again to God that it would rain and it rain. So he didn't just stop just saying, Oh, if you if you if you're righteous and you have an effectual perfect prayer. Much. Here's an example. Behind it, but as, to go back to what Sister Gonzalez was saying, see, we have to have, it's not just the mindset, you have to, you have to have prayer life. Amen. You can't just not pray to God at all, and then one day you just decide, Smooth sailing for the last 30 days. Now there's a hiccup or a bump in the road. Even if, even if, even if everything's going great, we should still be praying to God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Daily. If you don't have a prayer life, it's, you know, it's not going to. And that's really the one thing about having them all things in common is that we all should understand that we have to have the type of relationship. Amen. I think he was outside, but when we talked about number seven, what hinders our prayers for our brother and sister, I said it's relationships. Sister Stephen said, if I'm at all with my brother, that's one type of relationship. But what you're speaking to is a relationship with God. And obviously our prayer life is instrumental. It is concrete to our relationship with God. Brother Nick. Amen. Six. 
Yes. Ask God in prayer. In faith. Amen. 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 So in case they couldn't hear it online, Brother Nate said that the book of James really capsulizes or gives instruction for Christian living, and he just like he ended in um, chapter 5 with prayer, he begins in chapter 1 with prayer, asking God, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God, and then in uh, verse number 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing, nothing wavering. So back to that, have belief. You have to believe that he's going to answer your prayer or intercede to act on your behalf. Good stuff. Any other questions or comments? And you know, when, when we do the prayer requests, I try to remember as many names and what requests were made, but we need to understand that we're praying together. I'm leading the prayer, Nate's leading the prayer, brother, whoever it may be. But that doesn't mean when we get home and go to bed at night, we can't ask for prayer for Brother Flower's children or for Sister Jan Thompson. We, as a body, as members, need to remind. Don't try to remember everybody, but try to pray for those individuals later on. Might be Monday, Tuesday, whatever, but just remember those people who ask for prayer and pray for them. Amen. Any other questions or comments? I think I heard the bell, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. Next week, on the back of your paper, hopefully, I don't have it on mine, but extending hospitality to my brother, that's what we're going to be looking at. The Lord says the same on next Sunday. Extending hospitality to my brother. Let us together go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Father God in heaven, we just come to you with humbleness of heart, thanking you for blessing us with another day on this time side of life. We thank you for giving us a reasonable portion of health that we could come here and assemble to study another portion of thy word, Father God. Help us to continue to Dig into your word. Help us to study that we may get to know you better, Father God, through your word. Help us to daily strive to emulate your son, Jesus Christ, showing compassion for others, being a, a listener for those who need someone to vent to. Help us to be a shoulder to lean on for those who are suffering trials and tribulation. Father God, we ask that you... Be with us as we about make uh, means to go into our worship, that we clear our minds of the cares of this world so we can worship in spirit and in truth. And we ask that you be with those who may be en route to the building, that they make it here without any hurt, harm, or danger. We ask these blessings in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.